Christian church. I had a delightful uh, three days out on the farm. My granddaughter Ivy's birthday is today. She's seven years old. And we had a party for her yesterday and really enjoyed ourselves. So it is very good to um, do that, and I'm thrilled to get here on time. That's been 55 years, the closest I came to ever being late for a worship service, but I made it, so my record is still missing back. <laughs> Joys and concerns. Um, pray all in approval, Benedict, for, yes. Good, let's say happy birthday to him. You want to lead us?
It's true of all of us kind of lump with people who are like we are. I was never wild, so all of my friends growing up kind of had the same background as I had. And uh, they were all kind of nice people. But Jesus, he was willing to go anywhere. He was willing to search for people everywhere. And he would welcome them into his fold and he would love them. Jesus expected people to be good. He didn't want them to do bad things, but I wouldn't want anybody to ever think that. But you have to remember that Jesus came for all people. And today, I'm talking about Jesus calling Matthew, who was a tax collector, to be one of his followers. And I think that is so very important. Because of all the people in the first century that were generally disliked, nobody would be disliked more than was the person who collected taxes because they often stole money. It was almost a license to steal. And I'm going to be saying that in my sermon in a little bit. But Jesus reached out to him and he said, come. Follow me, and he became one of his disciples. And I'm sure he became a very good moral man when he followed Jesus. He was a person who would not cheat anybody ever again. But Jesus welcomed people who were sinners into his midst. And he would change them and he would love them. And that is something that the church always does. We're open to all of humanity. And we invite everybody to come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do change when we follow the Lord. And some people make a silly statement. They'll look at somebody and say, I don't want to come to church because there's a bunch of sinners there. And my response would be, see how bad we were if we didn't have the church. Because we're forgiven by Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father in God, each of us in our own way come before you with our prayers. O oh Lord, it is good to come before you to assemble ourselves in praise. For we know that you are the creator of the cosmos the one whose love is from everlasting to everlasting. We know that you care for your creation every second. We know that all life depends upon your love. And we thank you for the fact that you are a righteous God, the God that we can come to in hope. We pray that you will hear our prayer and answer us with your love. Fill our hearts with new direction this day. Sometimes we don't even know what to pray for. But all of us together know that we want world peace. We want nations to be able to live in harmony one with the other. We want an absence of hate, an absence of greed, an absence of fear. To that end, we ask that you be with all the believers of the earth, giving them wisdom to make decisions as they should be made, to bring people together with respect and trust. We pray that you will 
protect our military in the far places and here at home. Always be with them and keep them back to their barracks in safety. Protect our firefighters and police, all first responders. Ride with them on every call. May they save life. May they do good. May they always be safe. Give wisdom to our president and those who lead this nation. May they learn how to make decisions that enhance our democracy and bring people together in respect one for the other. We ask that you heal the sick everywhere, that you comfort the many who mourn, that you be with those who go through the valley of the shadow of death before this church worships again. We pray, Lord, that they have the hope of eternity. We're coming to the spring. We're beginning to think of the end of the school year and the graduations. Be with the young of our men, protect them, Keep them safe. We pray, Lord, for the whole church, all of Christianity. Give the church the ability to be the church you would have it be. Give us a clear voice, an evangelical call, where we, we reach out to the world with the saving message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we ask for great blessings upon the Adamsville congregation. We pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, give us new direction in which we can serve. May we truly, Lord, be the people you would have us be. And all of this we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come to our second hymn Come, ye sinners, for thee.
this morning. The big one is that we have our session trustee meeting immediately following our worship service down in the fellowship hall. Let us, well, we don't receive our offering anymore. We put it in the plates on either end of the church. We hope you've done that. Let's have a chat. Our Father in God, Again, it is we receive our offering and pray that it will be used effectively in the ministry. Not only here at Adamsville, but in the many missionaries we do support. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will bless us as we serve and as we share our gifts with you. In Jesus' name we ask. Say, 
oh, that we might see some good. Let, let, let the light of your face shine on us, Lord. You've put gladness in my heart, more than when there grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me lie down in safety. And our scripture lesson for this morning is taken from Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning with the ninth verse. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. As Jesus was walking along the path, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in his tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And immediately, Matthew got up and followed the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not believe for a second that this is the first time that Matthew ever saw Jesus. This incident occurred in the city of Capernaum. Jesus spent the first year of his ministry centered around this city. It was his home base. I am certain that Matthew knew that he was a despised tax collector, and I am certain he had heard and seen Jesus speak before. I do believe whenever it was the Lord spoke, he literally made the air electric with energy. Matthew naturally would have been drawn to the person of Jesus. Personally, I like to think that Matthew was not only thrilled, but he was delighted when he heard Jesus call out his name and ask him to be his disciple. This indeed is a great passage of Scripture. If you examine the synoptic Gospels, you will discover that Mark and Luke um, call Matthew Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Only in the Gospel of Matthew is the name Matthew used. In that day, it is a fact people usually had two names. One would be a Greek name, and the other would be a Hebrew name. In this case, Matthew had two Hebrew names, Matthew and Levi. And I would suggest this is truly possible. Take, for example, my daughter Ellie. Diana and I just enjoyed the delightful three days down on the farm with her. And I always call her Ellie. Never once in my life have I called her Mary, although her given name is Mary Ellen. She has two names, and she uses the second one. If Ellie would have surgery, they would have to warn the nurses ahead of time, if you're trying to wake her up, don't call her Mary. She would never respond to that name. Call her Ellie. So I would suggest that it is definitely the same person there. Matthew is Levi. He is Levi, the son of Elias. Now this is an important passage because it demonstrates that 
Jesus willingly associated with people who were considered to be genuine sinners. In fact, if you look closely at the life of Jesus, you will discover that all of the wrong people always were very comfortable around the master. Human beings who were considered to be moral reprobates were accepted as people with dignity when they came before the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, and you know this, no group of people in the ancient world were considered with any less respect than for the tax collectors. These were the people who collected taxes on the bridges and on the various items that would be taken over the borders or brought into the land. And such a person always was selected from the local population. This was the city of Capernaum, so Matthew definitely would have said lived within that city. He would be there because he knew the people and he knew how to accomplish his task. He would know where all of the money was and Matthew would know how to get it. Now in turn, this person would work for an individual who was called a tax farmer. And a tax farmer worked for a person who lived in another city, most likely in this case Jerusalem, and he would work for either the emperor of Rome or the person that the emperor appointed. The emperor would set a price tag, and he would say, this money has to come in for the city in which you serve. In turn, the tax farmer would set a price. And the guy on the bottom knew exactly what he had to pay. And so he would go out and he would charge whatever it is he wanted to charge, so not only he could make the debt for the people above him satisfied, but so that he could make a hefty profit. And this led in the first century to great extortion. The tax collector literally was a licensed robber. And that means when Jesus called Matthew, he called somebody who was a robber, who legally stole from people. And Jesus totally changed the man. And I would say Matthew stole no more. And the Jews also were terribly upset because the Romans worshipped many different gods. And the Jewish population worshiped only one God, the God who just happened to be the creator of the cosmos, the God who loved all people and who knew people by name. Therefore, their tax dollars ultimately were supporting heathen governments. And this was intolerable to them, where Yahweh was the only God that could be worshipped. So no one could have possibly been more hated in the first century than the tax collector. Now, I think I've used this story before in this church, but I remember when I was a boy in Pittsburgh, there was a local congregation that, re that received a huge inheritance from a gambler. And the session of that church debated for a long time whether or not they would accept that money, for they believed that it had come from evil. Finally, they accepted it, figuring that they could use it for good, but only after great debate. It was this way in the first century. You could not touch, literally, anything that a tax collector touched, because it was understood that if you did that, the evil of the person would rub off on you. If you swore an oath to a tax collector in the first century, you didn't have to keep that oath because the tax collector was considered to be such a low reprobate. The tax collector could not testify in court. They were excluded from religious fellowship. These people literally were to despise. In the first century, to be forgiven, 
You had to make up for all deeds that you ever did that hurt other human beings, and it was impossible to do this if you were a tax collector because so many people would have died. He didn't remember by name all of the people you swindled. So you were just considered a candidate for Sheol. The great part of Christianity is that we have something called amazing grace. Amazing grace is the very heart of the gospel. It's what I preach every single Sunday of my life. For the asking of our faith, we know that we are forgiven by the eternal God. We know that this God who forgives us is a good God, a righteous God, a God whose intention is to include his creation with him. The world did not have amazing grace before the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anonymous sin and death forced people into horrendous guilt. You simply couldn't escape your evil because you could not make up for it. I've always argued, and you've heard me argue this before, that guilt is absolutely no good. The only thing guilt's good for is if you can find the person you're hurt and ask for their forgiveness. Guilt is literally the dry rot of the soul. It can destroy a person, but if left unchecked. But we overcome guilt because, you see, we have a God who forgives us by name. If you ask for forgiveness, you know that your slate is white clean. I imagine you're tired of hearing me refer to Jeremiah 31, 31 and divine amnesia. For whatever it is, because of the new covenant we confess our sin, God literally remembers that sin no more. How tremendous it is that one of the original disciples was a tax collector. Someone considered to be a reprobate. This is a tremendous, powerful symbol. Here is a person everyone in the first century would reject. It was believed that this man could not get into heaven. Yet Jesus called a person who was believed to be outside of the possibility of salvation to be one of his disciples, one of his closest associates on this earth. And I suggest this fact is awesome. We get trapped if we don't read Greek because some of the Gospels suggest that this dinner party was in the home of Levi. But we're not sure where it was. It could have been in Levi's house or it could have been where it was that Jesus would live. But the fact is that the Sadducees and the Pharisees followed Jesus and the disciples and they saw them eating with a bunch of people who were considered to be too evil to associate with. And the scribes and the Pharisees immediately challenged the disciples and they asked them questions trying to get Jesus into deep trouble. Jesus was a good debater. I believe that this, the scribes and Pharisees were terrified of getting into a discussion with Jesus. So they went to the disciples and they asked, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered the question because he heard these people ask it. And he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, sinners are the special object of Jesus' concern. Jesus always is worried and he's always concerned about sinners. And Jesus restores sinners. He leads them to conversion. He tremendously changes people. 
Put it another way. Jesus ignores all of the categories always. Jesus invited all of the wrong people to surround him. And at the same time, he invited all of the right people to surround him. For the Lord Jesus Christ loved all people. Jesus then adds a very important statement. I desire not sacrifice. I come not to call the righteous but sinners. Jesus took this quote from the prophecy of Hosea. And it is a quote that has, as Jesus used it, he sacrificed. You see, the Jewish people loved to study scripture. They were great exponents of it. Yet, in their pretensions, they were sometimes worse sinners than the very people they condemned. They managed to separate themselves from the very people that Yahweh their God loved. We must also be on guard against this fellow. Jesus says sinners, not just nice church people. I argue that this passage gives a lot of hope. One of the great obstacles to grace is that we have committed sins, each and every one of us, that we cannot make good on. We have to believe that we really can be forgiven by God. Many people refuse to believe in forgiveness. This is one of the reasons for so many. Death is so tragic. You do not make up to someone who is dead unless you believe that God gives life. A good moralistic religion gives no hope because you cannot possibly correct the past. But with Jesus, the past is overcome. So we are all sinners, and we have to open the doors of our churches to sinners. We're not looking for a group of pastor saints. We are just looking for people who are standing in need of amazing grace. I have a platform I argue, and it's not my platform, it's Jesus' platform. He says that people can vote for judgment if they want, but if they vote for that, they have to live a perfectly righteous life. Or he says they can vote for mercy. And if you vote for mercy, you are asking God to vote for mercy for your life. When I look at Christianity, when I look at my faith, when I look at my own life, I know that I don't need judgment. What I need is mercy. I need to be forgiven by an incredibly good God who will put up with Harry John's in spite of all of the sins that I've committed, in spite of the damage I've done. And as I preach the gospel to others, it is this message I share. God comes for all people. Do not be afraid of God, but rather open your arms to and rush to God. For in Jesus Christ you will be forgiven and you will be given life that never ends. We close with him number 442 which really fits the song. Just as I am.